worship Jesus. Lord, we're so glad that you're here. If you will, you help us out and put your hands together as we sing this song.
the darkness has to retreat just one touch I feel the presence of heaven just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our God can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our God can't do oh you believe that today with just one word you heal what's broken inside me yes you do just one word you revive every dream oh just one touch i feel the power of heaven in just one touch my eyes are open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our god can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can't do there's nothing that our god can't do there's not a prison wall he can't break through oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can do For greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let's all agree. There's no power like the power oh, of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let's all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let's all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't do. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. No, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall he can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Sing, oh, oh. Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God, you are so welcome here today. God, we need you. You are our living hope. God, you are our strength and our provider. Come on, we sing this together. How great. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. 
Then through the darkness, your love and kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Yeah. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sins and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, oh, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, Lord, I'm yours forever. Oh, Jesus Christ, you're my living hope. Oh, we sing it. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Say hallelujah. Death has lost his grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living Seal the promise your very body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to that Jesus is your living hope. Last Sunday, four people made Jesus their living hope. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, 
turn your neighbor and tell them Jesus loves you, but I'm their favorite. I'm his favorite. Go ahead and tell them. He may love you, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> Man, it's so good to see everybody here today. Man, the Sunday after July 4th, everybody decides to come to 10 o'clock. Atta boy, I like it. Hey, it's so good to see you here this morning. If you're here for the first time, we are so honored to have you here with us. Uh, my name is Pastor Nick, and I am the senior pastor of the Jefferson Church. Been here, uh, it'll be six years in November, actually, six years in November. And I'm just so thrilled about what God is doing here and that you decided to be a part of it with us uh, today. I, I wanted to tell you that we get excited about a lot of really cool things that maybe some people don't get excited about. One thing we, we get excited about is the fact that we get to give today. We get to sow into the kingdom of God. Are you excited about giving today, everybody? Come on, let's put our hands together. We love to give. We love generosity. Because of that, we, we do something once a year that helps to, that helps to, um, really, not, not promote, but it helps to kind of allow believers, uh, specifically first-time believers, or maybe just simply people that you haven't done this yet in your life, we have what's called the 90-Day Tithe Challenge. It starts August the 1st of, the, 1st of this year, and what that is, is it's essentially a no-risk, money-back guaranteed chance for you to put your faith in God. Uh, the Bible says that when you give, when you tithe, specifically when you tithe, when you give the first 10% to the Lord, that he will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing, you will not have room to contain it. And so what we do here is we say, hey, for 90 days, if you'll commit to tithing, if you'll commit to giving what the Lord has asked you to give, if after those 90 days you don't feel more blessed, that you can't give actual evidence of God doing something spectacular and special in your life, Life, we will give you the, the money that you gave in those 90 days. We'll give it back to you. But can I tell you something? We've done this for almost six years now, and, and not one year have we ever had to give anything back. You want to know why? It's not because of us, and it's not because of you. It's because God's true to his word, everybody. We believe the Bible. We just believe that when you step out on faith and you do what you feel like you can't do, but you obey and step out in faith, God is going to make his word work for you on your behalf because he watches over his word to make sure that works. And so you'll be seeing that the next couple of weeks. I just want to tell you about that starting August the 1st. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have, God, just to be servants, for the opportunity we have that we don't have to, we get to. So today we don't have to give. If we feel like we have to give, we probably shouldn't give. But when we get that attitude that we get to, the Bible says you love us that much more. You love a cheerful giver. Somebody that says, I get to do this. I pray that you bless them. Bless the givers, the tithers, the ones that are faithful. God, just pray that you would increase their businesses, increase their health, increase their families. God, in every, in every uh, expanse of that word, that you will open up the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing. I pray that upon every faithful person this house. Thank you so much that you've called them, you've anointed them, you've appointed them, and God, you're going to guide them. Thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. These good-looking guys are going to serve you today. Just a couple things I want to say before we get started. Um, as we said, August the 1st is where we start our 90-day tithe challenge, but in my opinion, it's more important than that. August the 1st, 1st is when we start our 21 days of prayer. Prayer is a very vital part of our church. Matter of fact, you have pastors, even other denominations that have contacted us and said, hey, there's a miracle going on in, in little rural Jefferson, Georgia. What's going on? And we tell, they, they ask us, what our secret sauce is, so to speak, and I say it's prayer, that we put a, a high priority, we put a high uh, value on prayer, and so for these 21 days of prayer and fast, uh, not fasting, but just prayer, thank God, <laughs> fasting's in, in January, prayer is in August, we do that on purpose, but um, uh, I, and for prayer, starting August the 1st, we want to invite you to be a part of that, we'll give you more information on that as the weeks go, but that starts August 1st as well. VBS is coming up this Sunday, come on parents, say woo! Yeah, you get a little two-hour date night. Come on, somebody. You get to drop the kids off Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 6 until 8 right here at the church. We're going to have hundreds of kids show up, so many door holders, so many volunteers. We're very, very thankful for those of you that decided to serve uh, in this, that get to serve. Man, we're just so blessed to have you as a part of our church. And so we want to ask you to be a part of that. You can sign up online at 
jefferson.church/connect. Sign your kid up online just to give us an idea of how much goldfish we need to buy. <laughs> just to give us an idea of how many popsicles and s'mores and everything else that we need to get. Um, so you can sign up there or you can sign up the day of. Just come here and uh, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. So literally it's a free two hour date night with your spouse. Um, have fun with that Sunday through Wednesday and your kids are going to get the word of God. Pastor Kayla is just doing such an amazing job and so I want to tell you about that. Um, last one, uh, second to last one, this Wednesday night, 6.30, middle school and high school is having a movie night. So if you want to uh, uh, get your middle schoolers and high schoolers to come here, Pastor Corey and his team, they're doing such a phenomenal, just a great job. Pastor Corey is one in a million. I mean, he's just, he is just a special, special guy. Um, he gets leadership. He gets uh, stewarding the gifts that God has given him. He's just such an amazing person. And, and I'd say it to his face, but he's not here. He's up top with our middle schoolers. So you want him. I'm telling you, you want your kids to rub shoulders with this guy because he's just a different kind of a guy. So that's this Wednesday from 6.30. Sorry, starting at 6.30. And then last but not least, everybody, the Bible says to give honor where honor is due. My mom is here with us, everybody. Come on, let's give her a hand. She's here with us today. Mom, I can say in every sense of the word, I would not be here without you. And uh, in every sense of the word, I'm very thankful for you. And my mom being here is just special. And now I'm nervous. So anyway, we'll um, we'll get we'll get going. We're right in the middle of a series. If you're here with us for the first time, we've been walking through the book of Proverbs. The greatest thing about Proverbs is it's one of the most practical books in the Bible. I like to say that James is the Proverbs of the New Testament, and Proverbs is the Proverbs of the Old Testament. I mean, it's just it just makes sense. It's really something you can dig your teeth into, go home, and think about. And that's what today's message is. It's one of those things that is it's not an amen, it's not an up and holler. You can give me an amen, you can up and holler if you want to. That's fine with me. Uh, but it's one of those that hopefully is going to make you uh, evaluate your life and evaluate what we're talking about today because it's wisdom that works. It's not just knowledge, but it's wisdom that works in our lives. And, and our key verse has been Proverbs 4, 7. Again, this is probably the seventh, eighth Sunday we've talked about the book of Proverbs. So you might know this by heart by now. Hopefully that's the point, you know. We hide God's word in our heart. It says, wisdom is supreme. Therefore, to get wisdom, gain wisdom, though it costs you all that you have, you need to go ahead and write that check. You need to go ahead and make that appointment. You need to go ahead and, and schedule that lunch with that person because wisdom is so important. You need to get gain understanding in every area of your life. Listen to me, fathers, you need more understanding. You need more wisdom. Wives, moms, husbands, workers, co-workers, businessmen, businesswomen, you need more understanding, not just in the spiritual way, but it's talking in every sense of the word. Go after, make a list of things you are weak at in your life. Find people that are good at those things you're weak at and go talk to them. Go make a lunch. Go schedule something. I just blessed you. You didn't even know it. That's exactly what you need to do in your life before this summer is over. It's almost over. Isn't that crazy? Before this summer is over, that's something that you need to do. And so today, we've been talking about wisdom in, in so many different capacities and forms, but I want to talk about one that we don't think about very often. And I want to talk about the wisdom of our relationships, that we need to begin building wise relationships in our life. Father, once again, I thank you so much for the gift I thank you so much for the anointing. I thank you so much that you have appointed me to this place, to this pulpit, to this uh, uh, position for this season of my life. And I pray it's for the rest of my life. I love Jefferson. I love this community. I love Jackson County. And I want to shine your light, Jesus, to, to, to the biggest degree possible so that so many people can see that you are good and that you love them and that you want to help them in their life. Help us to be that light. Help us to be that city on a hill, that, that beacon for everybody to see. I pray for every church. I pray for Southside. I pray for Galilee. I pray for New Grace today, going through transition there. I pray um, for uh, Hope's Crossings. I pray for Crossroads Baptist, First Baptist, First Methodist. This, the Catholic Church up the road. I pray for all these churches that your spirit would just lay hold and grab a hold of their hearts, the people that are there, and that people's lives would forever be changed. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen, amen. Time 
is very, very valuable. Time is extremely important. You could almost argue that time would be precious. I heard somebody say it like this, that days go by slow, but years go by fast. I, I see on Facebook all the time, the, the memory section of Facebook, you say this happened a year ago, this happened two years ago, this happened three years ago, and we see it all the time with our kids, how little they were, how small they were, and I tell Chanel all the time, kind of in a, in a, in a, f- a fun spirit, I tell her when Georgia Beth, she's almost 10 months old now, and I tell her almost every single a week, I say she will never be this little ever again. You know, like that, just to kind of, but because time is precious, time is valuable, time is extremely important. You can even look at time as an investment, and you should. The Bible says we don't have a lot of it. There's a limited amount of time that you have on this earth from the time you're born until the time you are dead. That's all you have. And then after that, the Bible says the judgment and eternity. And I'm telling you that you have to make the most of your time. The Bible says we don't have a lot of time. David said, Teach me to number my days. You have numbered my days. The book of James says that your life is like a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. So in essence, the time that you have in your life right now, whether you're young or whether you're old, the time that you have left, it is an investment opportunity. It's important. It's valuable. It's precious. And I'm telling you, you have to start investing your time where you get more bang for your buck, so to speak. Because how many of you know wasting your time is awful? Doing things that waste your time is awful. I'll never forget, I went to the DMV during uh, COVID, during the quarantine, during the shutdown. I stood in line on a Saturday morning from 7.30 until noon, and they, that's when they closed was at noon. I, stand, I stood in line the whole time. I was the last person, I was the, the next person in line. They came in, I was talking to a lady uh, behind me, an elderly lady, and I'm not saying this to pump myself up, it's just a story, but there was a, an elderly lady behind me, and they said, okay, one more, and they pointed at me, and it, I was the next one in. I've been waiting all day but this lady behind me I don't know if she was telling the truth but she told me a pretty sad sob story about what was going on and I said ma'am you can go on ahead you can go on and she said are you serious like I wasn't playing this the whole time are you serious and she goes in and I walked away from that DMV I just remember thinking I have literally wasted four and four or five hours of my life just trying to get here and do this and wouldn't you know what the lady comes in and says all right we'll take one more if you're going to be good Samaritan we can come on in I was like see I know the Bible. It works. So anyway, it's important that you spend your time where it's most valuable. It's important that you invest your time with your children where it's most valuable, with your spouse where it's most valuable, in your job where it's valuable because you need to know who to be around and what to be around where you're going to get more bang for your buck. And so today I want you to look at time as an investment. I want you to look at the time you have left as something that is monetary. It is mon- it, it, it's something that when you have a plumber or an electrician come to your house, you are not paying them for the 30 minutes it took them to build fix whatever you messed up, you are paying them for the training and the experience, the years that they put into their profession. Same thing with lawyers and doctors. You're not paying for the hour or the 30 minute visit that you're doing. You're paying for the years of schooling it took them to get there. Time is an investment and we have to start seeing it that way. And in the same way, I would say when you invest your time in relationships, it's a good investment. But you got to know the right relationships to invest your time in. And I think as a society where we are right now, we are not very good at knowing where to or who to invest our time in. And that's what today is all about. There's a phrase I'm going to say over and over and over today, and I need you to hear it, write it down, take a picture of it, whatever it is. But it's this, the quality of your relationships are going to determine the quality of your life. If you don't like where your life is going right now, look at the friends that you have around you. The Bible even says that, that the person who has fools around them will become a fool himself. The person who has wise people around them will be wise themselves. I've heard people say like this, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You show me the people you spend time with and I will show you where your destiny is headed, where your life is headed. Now for young people in the room, you don't hear it because you think you have all the time in the world, but I'm telling you, look at your time as an investment, a limited amount, a limited resource, and I need you to hear it one more time, that the quality of your relationships will determine the quality of your life. If you don't believe me, you can ask people around you. If you don't believe the people around you, you can believe the Bible. You can look at relationships that totally derailed men of God and women of God in biblical times. Look at Samson and Delilah. Samson was a judge. Samson was a hero. Samson was supposed to pull the children of Israel out of this bondage and out of this place where they were being uh, uh, thwarted by the Philistines and their enemies all the way around them. Samson was supposed to be the guy, the quote, savior of Israel at that time. But guess what? There was a little hussy named Delilah that messed that up. 
totally, I can't, I said that for my mama, I'm sorry, but <laughs> there, there was this relationship that messed him up. There was a relationship that got the better of him, and it totally derailed everything that he was supposed to do. You show me the quality of your relationships, and it will determine the quality of your life. You look at another one like uh, uh, um, um, Abraham and Sarah. Abraham had this calling on his life, and it just felt like he was dragging Sarah along with his calling the whole time where she was complaining and not wanting to do this and lying and getting upset and and being mad at God. It just felt like she just kind of kept holding him back, and that was a relationship that was an issue in his life even though it was his wife you look at positive ones like Jonathan and David King David was the man but he had this relationship with this guy named Jonathan where they helped each other and they prodded one another along and sharp, iron sharpening iron. I mean, it was, it was this awesome relationship. You look at Paul, all the issues that he went through, all the persecution he went through. He needed a confidant. He needed somebody to encourage him, and that man's name was Silas. And as Paul and Silas did a huge missionary journey all throughout the New Testament and really, really changed the world and flipped it upside down, it wasn't just Paul. He needed relationships around him to help support him in his life and I'm telling you you need relationships to help support you you can't do this by yourself you are not meant to do life by yourself but the quality of those relationships will determine the quality of your life I guarantee you that there are people right now that are in this room you're gray-headed and you know that this statement is truer than what you're acting like right now that the quality of the relationships there are bad decisions you have made because of the people you have hung out with if you, want to be, if you want to be rich, don't hang around poor people. Don't, don't hang around people that don't know how to handle their money. If you want to be a good father, don't hang around somebody that has a hobby and puts their hobby in front of their kids. I'm just saying the, the quality of your relationships will determine the quality of your life. Even Jesus knew the importance of choosing the right relationships. A very uh, not well-known verse in John chapter 2, verse 23. Because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust him. I mean, Jesus was like the Justin Bieber on the scene like everybody was following him everybody wanted to know where he was everybody wanted to know where he lived they wanted to know all these information about him like they wanted Jesus because of the miracles and because of the signs that were there but Jesus did not trust them Jesus you didn't trust people no he did not he loved everybody liked everybody was called to everybody but he did not trust everybody what kind of lesson is that for us he trusted his three He trusted his 12. He trusted the ones that were there close and beside him. But many came to trust, many began to trust in him. But Jesus didn't trust them because he knew all about people. And no one needed to tell him about human nature for he knew that what, he knew what was in each person's heart. It wasn't that Jesus trusted no one. It was that he was, listen to this, he was discerning. And that's what I'm trying to get across to you today. Especially anybody in this room that's under the age of 30, I need you to know the relationships in your life, you need discernment in your life because it can vastly change the trajectory of your life. Choosing your relationships wisely, that's the discernment we are talking about. He had different relationships with different kind of people. He met a lot of people. He, he enjoyed being around a lot of people, but he put these people in different categories, in different relationships. And guess what? The book of Proverbs encourages this. The book of Proverbs says that you will fall under, you will be in front of many, many people, many acquaintances. You will have many relationships with people in your life. But the Bible says you need to begin putting them in their boxes, putting them in their place or in their lanes, so to speak. In Proverbs 24, it says, this there's three people that the bible speaks of specifically that are we will encounter in our life proverbs 24 don't envy evil people everybody say evil. evil yes they are out there and we'll talk about that in a second don't envy evil people or desire their company for their hearts plot violence their words always stir up trouble a house that is built by wisdom becomes strong through good sense but the wise everybody say wise The wise are mightier than the strong, and those with knowledge grow stronger and stronger. So don't go to war without wise guidance. Victory depends on having many advisors. Wisdom is too lofty for fools. Everybody say fools. Among leaders at the city gate, they have nothing to say. 
Proverbs 24 lays it on the line for us. It says you will meet three types of people in your life. You'll meet evil people, you'll meet wise people, and you'll meet fool pe- fools. The important thing is not that you don't meet them or don't, because they're going to come at you in your life. It's almost something that you cannot uh, get away from. But the important thing is, are you putting them in the right categories of your life? In other words, there are lanes that you need to put all three of these people in, in your life. You need to put the wise people here, the foolish people here, and the evil people over here, and keep Keep them in their lanes. Lanes are extremely important. They really, really are. You're not supposed to cross a double line when there's a slow car on a two-lane highway. Now, we all know we've all done that. Don't lie. You're in church. We all know that when a slow car is in front of you, you want to cross again from them as best you can. But lanes are extremely important. They are here for your protection. That's what they're here for. That God says, I want you to put these three types of people in the proper lanes. Don't put an evil person over here in the wise category. Don't put a foolish person over here in the wise category. Because I'm te- Don't put a wise person over here in the evil category. Just because they don't agree with what you're saying doesn't make them evil. Come on, somebody. J- just because they disagree with your way of life and disagree with the way you're thinking, it doesn't make them evil. In some instances, they could be wise and God's sending that person to you to gain wisdom. But lanes are so important and the Bible is saying, Proverbs 24 says, put fools, evil people, and wise people, put them in their lanes, and it will help you. Why? Because the quality of your relationships will determine the quality of your life. Guaranteed, promise you, you can write the book on that one. When I was uh, at a mission trip in Jamaica, uh, when we got off the plane, I was about 13, 14 years old. I can't believe my mom let me go, but we went to Jamaica on a mission trip, and um, uh, I remember getting off the plane and going to the airport and walking out, and you guys, there were no cars. There were no cars. There were bicycles and, and motorcycles. Like, that's all there was, really dirt bikes. There were almost no cars whatsoever, but the thing about these dirt bikes is they had a lot of people on these dirt bikes. You guys, I saw six people and a chicken on one dirt bike. It was crazy. I kid you not, it was the dad, the mom, a kid on the back, the mom holding a kid, a kid on the front wheel, and then a chicken. It was, it was just absolutely unbelievable. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to survive. Like, I don't, like this is crazy. We finally got in a van. We go from point A to point B. And you guys, in, in the inner city Kingston, there are no lines. <laughs> there are no speed limits. There are no red lights or green lights. There's no yield signs. There's no nothing. There's, you figure it out. That's basically what it comes to when you go there. And I never forget, like, there's, there's no sense of of direction. There's no sense of, of, of giving people turns or anything like that. There was a lot of horns being blown and a lot of gestures out the window. That's all there really was when I was down there in Jamaica at that young age. And I'm telling you, it was complete and absolute chaos, absolute chaos, simply from having no lanes. You need lanes in your life, but even sometimes the lanes can be confusing. You guys remember when they put the roundabout in at Galilee Church Road and Highway 11? Come on, somebody. You slammed on brakes, didn't you, when you first came to that roundabout? It was confusing. as all. It's still pretty confusing. But, but you know, like, you go first. No, you go first. Okay, I'm going to go first. And everybody hates that person that feels like they just own the road. It, it just, it causes issues. You've got to have lanes in your life. That speaks bigger than just relationships. That speaks about the amount of time you spend in places. You can't spend all your time on your hobbies, dads. You can't spend all your times on whatever women spend their time on, ladies. You, you, got, you, have, you, have to, you have to spend your time, you have to spend your time, put them in the right lanes and the right places. Some of you husbands are like, no, 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 you better shut up or you get something. To to. Anyway, I'll stop. But there are three lanes for all of, all of the relationships in our life. Three lanes for all of our relationships. It's important that you put people in the right lane and the quicker you identify who that person is and the quicker you put them in that lane, the better your life is gonna be. Because I, I'm here to tell you that not everyone in your life deserves to have access to your life. L- l- listen to me, social butterflies and Facebook people. Let me just tell you, not everybody in your life deserves access to your life. That you have to put them in the proper lanes in the proper time. I'm telling you that, that oftentimes people feel like they want attention. They feel like they want more friends. What you really need is peace in your life. That's what you really need. The Bible says, I know you want money. Money's not what you want. You want the peace that you think money's going to bring you. I know that you want friends, but you don't need friends. You want the peace that you think having a lot of friends is going to bring you. In other words, listen to me. Start putting your relationships in the right lanes of your life, and I promise you, your life will be better. Why? Because the quality of your relationships will determine the quality of your life. I I read a study that said in one year, 
the average person will meet about 1,200 people, 1,200 brand new relationships or new acquaintances in one year, just 1,200. And it said the introverts meet about 500 in a year. Introverts, where are you? You're not going to raise your hand. You're introverted. But anyway, <laughs> um, about, about, <laughs> uh, <laughs> about 500 people. About 500 people, that, that's how many introverts will, will meet. And then the extroverted people, you're like, whoa, when's he going to tell me to raise my hand? I just want to raise my hand. You're like, that, that's huge people. <laughs> about the, you'll meet about 2,500 people a year. So, like, those are the, I, I'm one of those, um, my, my mom, my wife, they've all understood me. I am an introverted extrovert. When I'm in a grocery store, I'm pretty introverted. Like, I'm just kind of head down, hey, earbuds in, just kind of walking. I'm at church, I'm the life of the party. Like, that, I just, I, I can be an extrovert when I need to be, but when I'm by myself, I'm more introverted in, in that respect. And so I'm telling you that you will, you will see in between 500 and 2,500 brand new relationships every single year. And I'm telling you this, the Bible says they fall into three categories. They fall into three categories, the people that you meet in your life. And so we're going to walk through those categories today, and then we'll let you go home. The first category that people will fall into as you meet them, you will meet wise people. I want to start off with a good one. You will meet wise people. Right now, I want you to stop and think about who are wise people in your life. Who is somebody that has given you wisdom? Uh, maybe they're in heaven right now. If they're in heaven, you need to find new wise people. It doesn't matter what age you are. You need to find people that just have wisdom in life. And, and you need to understand that you need to cultivate relationships and put them in that lane with wise people. The Bible says in Proverbs 9, it says, So don't bother correcting mockers. They will only hate you. But correct the wise and they'll love you see wisdom's not just about knowledge it's about the way you react to stuff correct the wise and they will love you instruct the wise and they will be even wiser they'll gain from it teach the righteous but the bible says that righteous wisdom is righteousness righteousness is wisdom teach the righteous and they will learn even more so first of all, let me just say it like this. Nobody in this room is wise in every area of their life. If you are wise in every area of your life, Jesus, we are glad you are here this morning. But <laughs> other than that, other than that, we are all dumb or foolish in one area of our, for, for instance, when we were doing uh, the remodel on our home, when we did that remodel, uh, I had a guy come in. His name was Dylan Duran. He's amazing. He's a carpenter, does woodwork, does phenomenal stuff, did, did a really, really great job. And as I was asking him his opinion, why did you put the screw there? Why did you put the nail there? Why has the board got to be there? Like, I was asking him all these questions. He was wise in that area. But I am not going to ask Dylan Duran to help fix my golf swing. Why? Because he cannot play golf. Like, that's just, he's, he's wise in one area, and that's great, and I need to learn from him in that one area. But he's not wise in everything. So how does that translate you will meet people that are great with money, but they're bad with relationships. So don't copy relationships from them. Copy their financial habits from them. You will meet people that are great with relationships, but they're bad with their personal health. I'm telling you, you don't need to copy their personal health. You need to copy their relationships. And I'm not talking about how smart you are or your IQ. More or less, the wisdom I'm talking about is the character of the person. So I just want to walk through what the Bible says a wise person looks like so that you can identify them when you meet them because you're going to meet these type of people this year. Wise people are humble. They're teachable. Uh, my coaches used to say they're coachable. You know, that's one thing that I, I heard growing up all the time. They're humble. They're teachable. They, 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 don't, they don't think that they hung the moon. They don't think that they're, they're the center of everybody's world. They actually just sit in the back of a room sometimes, and they'll just sit and listen. Do you know there's a reason why God gave you one mouth and two ears? Come on, somebody. That's simple, but it really makes a difference in your life. They're humble. They're teachable. They sit there, and they listen. The second quality the Bible gives wise people is when you confront them, they will consider it and not immediately get defensive. Can I tell you that's one pure sign of a foolish person. When you come to them and you try to correct them in love, with truth in love, and they immediately get defensive, that's the key sign of a foolish person. But a wise person will step back, kind of reevaluate, reconsider, is this something I need to hear? Is this something I need to collect in my life? That's what wise people do. Uh, the third thing wise people do is they embrace reality. One of the biggest things of foolish people is they're not just dreamers, they're daydreamers. I mean, they just keep going on and on and on, and they'll let their bills go, and they'll let all kinds of other stuff fade away. Why? Because they don't embrace reality. In other words, wise people fix what's right in front of them. They fix the problem that's right in front of them. They're not an ostrich that puts their head in the sand and pretends like it's not there. They fix the problem that's right in front of them. Let me just go ahead and give you some wisdom, fellas. If you walk in the room, if, you're, if you walk in your house, and your wife is crying and cleaning her gun, you need to fix that problem, okay? 
immediately. That is not one of those just sweeping under the rug and she'll be fine tomorrow. You need to face reality in that, in that instance. Hey, for, for our health in this room, listen to me. You need to face reality. All the foods you eat cannot end in the word Eto's. <laughs> That's just reality. <laughs> Cheetos, Doritos, Fritos, burritos, <laughs> taquitos, you, you can't, like, it's just, it's just common sense, it's reality, you got to face it, it's just the way it is, if you want to live a long life and see your grandkids, you can't eat a lot of foods that end in the word Eidos. Um, another thing that wise people do, they have empathy, they have empathy, they have compassion towards people, in other words, um, uh, the decision that they, they understand that the decisions they make affect other people, hey, moms and dads, grandparents, listen to me, the decisions you make will affect your kids, they will affect your grandkids. You need to be wise in that respect. The Bible says wise people understand that their actions will affect other people. And, and, and in most cases, you could call that even compassion is another way to talk about empathy. And compassion was the number one emotion that was talked about when Jesus was on this earth. That the Bible constantly talks about he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them. But the thing I want to talk to you about with wise people is how they relate to you. Because you can see wise people, but if you don't put them in that category, if you don't help them, if they don't, you don't allow them to help you in your life, it's no good for anybody. So I want to help you to identify who these wise people are and what you need to do with them. First of all, a wise person is a coach, not a critic. A wise person in your life. If they are coaching you, they're wise. If they're criticizing you, they're not wise. Let me tell you the difference. A coach and a critic say the exact same thing, but it's the way they say them. A coach and a critic, they both tell you what's wrong, they both tell you what you're not doing right, but it's the tone, it's the empathy, it's the compassion, it's the love. The Bible says that Jesus spoke the truth, but he spoke the truth in love. That's a coach. You need, to, you need to be able to decipher who's a critic and who's a coach because coaches are wise. They bring wisdom in your life. An another way that you know that a relationship is wise is if conflict comes in the relationship and it actually matures or grows the relationship because of conflict. Uh, my wife and I, we have never fought a day in our life. We have moments of intense fellowship. That's what a pastor has in his house. Intense fellowship. That's as KJV as I can put it. Intense fellowship. And Chanel and I, when we get into an argument or an intense fellowship discussion, when we get in those moments, it might take a few hours or a few days. It might take a while, but at the end of it, we come together and it's like, okay, what did you learn? What did I learn? I learned not to say that. Like, you learned not to do. Like, we learn things. It grows our relationship and we move on from it. That just shows you that wisdom is there and you need to keep that person in your life. And the thing about wise people, listen to me, sp specifically uh, people who are Christians and that are wise, they gain their source of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. They, they live by the Holy Spirit. The pool of knowledge and wisdom they pull from, it comes from the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, not on the screen, but Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 says this. See that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as the wise, understanding what the Lord's will is. Understanding, walking with the Holy Spirit. Those people are wise. And so when it comes to your time, that you are investing, when it comes to your time, that you have a limited amount of resource on, when it comes to your time, wise people, you need to give them more time. Give them more of your time. You need to put wise people in this lane over here. This is the lane that, that I want to, this is the lane I want to spend more time on. I need to spend more time in my business. I need to spend more time being a good dad. I need to spend more time being a good mom, being a good wife, being a good husband. Okay, find wise people, put them in that lane and spend more time with them, more of your time. Why? Because the Bible says so, Proverbs 4, 7. If you don't have wisdom, you need to go get it. Go out and seek it with everything that you have. Don't sit here and leave today and go, oh, wasn't that a good sermon? No, take it and walk out the door and actually do something with it because guess what, everybody? We are all failures at some part of our life. There is some part of our life we are foolishly walking about and we're just dragging it along. And the Bible says, seek out the people who are wise in those areas and you will become wise in that area. Seek out the people that have wisdom in that area of life and you yourself will gain wisdom. Put more time, more emphasis on hanging around wise people. Can somebody say amen? Number two, the Bible says, there's a second type of person you're going to encounter. Not just wise people, <laughs> this is a big old road. This is 85 with six lanes right here. This is a big road. You will meet a bunch of foolish people, a ton of foolish people. Like, like I would say out of the relationships that you're going to meet, you're going to meet a lot of people 
that are just really fools. And, and I, would, I would just say about foolish people that they have the lack of an ability to really uh, learn. Um, another thing that's like a key sign, a key sign of foolish people is they love to argue. <laughs> I think internet is the Greek word for uh, uh, fool. I really think it is. Like I, because like when you think of Facebook, when you think of all those like message boards and all that kind of stuff, and like you post one simple comment and all of a sudden you got 120 comments lined up right after it. Like there was one about the church on a message board somewhere. And, and so many people came to our defense, and that's, that's great, that's awesome. But, but like when you see those things, you just see argument after argument after argument after argument. And the Bible says those people are fools because they're looking for arguments. You are finding, and in today's culture, come on somebody, you are finding more and more people, all they want to do is argue. They don't want to be right. They don't want you to be right. They don't want you to be wrong. They just want to argue about the situation. The Bible calls those people foolish, and that's the majority of the people you will meet in your life. This is a very, very wide lane. Proverbs 1.7 says this, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. You want to know the key sign that you're dealing with a fool? If they say something like this, oh, yeah, I already knew that. That's a fool. Need to watch out. Now, if it's something like Georgia's going to win the national championship, oh, yeah, I already knew that. Okay, that's fine. Like, that's a wise person. I get that. <laughs> This year, by the way, not, that, that wasn't like prophecy. That was this year. It's going to happen this year. Um, that's a wise person. But, but you, say, you say something that the Lord's shown you or you say something that maybe they didn't know and you know they don't know. And, you, and all of a sudden, it's, I, and I have people like that in my life that I'll just say, it's, it, I might as well not even waste my breath because they already know it. <laughs> it's like, well, did you? Yeah, I already knew that. All right, that's a key sign that you are dealing with a grade A fool, and that's what the Bible says. Proverbs 26, 3. I love this verse. It made no sense to me at first. I don't think it's going to make sense to you, but hopefully I'll explain it well. Proverbs 26, 3. Guide a horse with a whip, a donkey with a bridle, and a fool with a rod to his back. Pastor Nick, where did that come from? <laughs> what does that even mean? What it means is foolish people only learn from painful consequences. That's how foolish people learn. There are people in this room that are foolish because you only learn when something hurts you. You don't learn from the wisdom of everybody else around you. There's something that, <laughs> there's something I heard a coach say one time. He said, he said, don't, um, he said, only fools pay the dumb tax. And I said, what's the dumb tax? He says, everybody's going to do something dumb at some point in their life. Let them pay that bill. You learn from their mistakes, and that way you don't pay the dumb tax. You know what, Jefferson Church? I don't want us to have to pay the dumb tax. I, w I want us to have wisdom in our life and not be foolish that pain is the only thing, that consequence is the only thing that teaches us anything, that we have got to learn from other people, but fools don't know that because they already know everything. In other words, they do it like this. They don't know how to handle money until they lose all their money. Then they learn how to handle their money. They, they don't know that they don't go to counseling until their marriage is over or almost over, and then they go to counseling. There's a lot of people like that. Um, there are parents. You don't read a parenting book. You don't get counseling for your kids. There's no, there, there's no better way to get more wisdom than being a parent to a teenager. God bless all of you. But I'm just saying, you, you, you don't read parenting books. You don't even try to be wise as a parent, and then all of a sudden your kid is breaking all Ten Commandments on TikTok. Like, that's just the way it, that's just the way it looks right I mean painful experiences are what teach foolish people in other words pain almost motivates them because um, they live their life in this constant state of turmoil it's pain that teaches them not to go left not to go right it's pain that does, those are foolish people foolish people are also they have low empathy they have no empathy. In other words, they, they do things that cause other people hurt, but they don't see it as hurtful to them. Now, I, I know a lot of people like this. I know a lot of people that they're like a bull in a china shop, but they don't care as long as their feelings are met, as long as their emotions are okay. That's all that matters. And, you know, oftentimes their, their relationship or your relationship with them is like a circus. <laughs> they get the circus. They get the fun. You're the guy behind the elephant with the shovel. <laughs> Y'all know what that means, don't you? That's how you would categorize your relationship with them. They make all the bad decisions, you're the one cleaning up the mess. There are people in your life, you've got brothers and sisters. <laughs> you, maybe some of you have parents in your life. Maybe some of you have kids in your life. This is the story. Their, their, their story is foolish. This is something that completely um, uh, uh, really gives them a pointed, uh, to, uh, points to them. The third thing is, is that they become this righteous victim. Fools, everything is everybody else's fault. 
That's how you know you're dealing with a foolish person. If everything is everybody else's fault, if, if, if I sit down with somebody and I'm counseling with them or talking with them about an issue in their life, and the first thing out of their mouth, well, it's them, it's them, it's them, it's them. If I could just get rid of them, I'm just going, no, 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 this is a foolish conversation. I don't call them fools. This is a foolish conversation. It's not them. It's, it's you. You control you. You can't control them. So don't be foolish in thinking that. But foolish fools are always the righteous victim. And I'm telling you, parents, we can, we can fall into this trap so many times, and here's how. My wife and I, we fell into the trap of our daughter is right and you're wrong one time in our life. I'll tell you the story. We were, she was five years old. She was our first little girl, precious. I mean, just precious little girl named Brooklyn. She had curly hair. I mean, just like it would like attach to her head as curly. as I mean, it was, it was just precious. She went to K-5 at Mount Vernon in Hall County. That was when we were in Gainesville. And this teacher gets, sends us a message, an email one day, and said, Brooklyn pushed somebody down on the playground, and would you please talk to her about it when you get home? Well, Brooklyn knows, even at five, she knows. You get a teacher, uh, teacher to send us a message from the school, you're going to get in trouble. So we started talking to Brooklyn about it. We said, Brooklyn, did you push somebody down? No, Danny, I didn't. <laughs> Brooklyn. Did you put, no, Daddy, I didn't. And then Chanel, we asked her like five minutes later. That's the trick because kids forget. We asked them like five or ten minutes later to try to match the answers. Brooklyn, did you push somebody down? No, no I, did, I didn't push. Well, then what happened? Well, I was just there and I was just at a monkey bar and somebody just bumped into me. And as I just, as they bumped into me and I kind of went this way and I brushed her shoulder and they flopped on the ground like LeBron in an NBA game. And it's just like, it was like, <laughs> 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 That's, that's just what happened. I mean, like, she, she comes up with this elaborate, and I'm going, me and Chanel looked at each other. She had never lied to us before that we knew it. She had never lied to us before. So clearly, that teacher was in the wrong. Every teacher in the room, <laughs> you hate us right now because we're, we were those parents, right? We called the school. We called the teacher. We said, listen. <laughs> Our daughter did not do this. She is right. And I don't know what you saw, but you did not see what you think you, I, I don't know what, yeah, we're, maybe you were second-handed information, but no, and she said, Mr. Dalton, I saw her push the kid down with my own two eyes, both arms and hands extended. <laughs> and I went, I'm sorry, you'll never hear from us again, that's okay, you know. <laughs> So from that point forward, we have just decided the teacher is right. Like, unless you give us convincing evidence otherwise, the kid, our kids, coming with something, the kids are always in the wrong, and the, the adults are always in the right. That's just the way we have learned uh, from that. But, but fools, they're, they're righteous victims. Something is always somebody else's fault. DJ, you can come, or musicians, you can come. Um, they foolishly, their, their foolishness just leads to self-destruction and destruction of people around them. You see, foolish people, they live by the flesh. They don't live by the spirit. Foolish people live by what pleases them. Foolish people live by according to their laws, their bylaws, their ordinances. That's what fool, They're all about them and what they can conjure up for them in their life. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I'm going to help you out. With wise people, you need to put them in more time. You need to give more time. That's the lane. But the foolish people, you need to give them less time in your life. I'm not saying completely cut them out. Because to completely cut them out, with some, for some of us, we wouldn't have relationships with our brothers and sisters. To completely cut them out, we wouldn't have relationships with our parents. To completely cut them out, some of us wouldn't have relationships with our kids. I talked to a dad that walked out of here today. He said, that message was just for us. He said, our kids are doing this and doing this and making us the bad guy for their foolish decisions. He said, you're right. He said, I'm not saying give them less time in the respect of, like, don't spend time with them. I'm just saying, hey, you need to give boundaries to people. Lanes are here to protect us. We drive a road with lanes for your protection. And that's what the Bible's saying. We just need to simply give them less of our time. Give them boundaries in your life. Proverbs 13 says it like this. He who walks with the wise grows wise, but he who walks with fools will become foolish or will have harm on himself. I, I like this translation better. I say my mama came up with this. I'm not quite sure if that's the absolute truth, but I think she said this to me one time. She said, walk with the wise and become wise. Walk with the fools and you go to jail. That's just the way it is. You get in that lane of your life and, and you constantly are surrounding yourself with foolish people. Come on, let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about our golf buddies. Let's talk about our drinking buddies. Ladies, let's talk about our shopping parties that we have. Let's talk about those girls night out. Like, you surround yourself with foolish people, you're going to become a fool yourself. Listen to me. It's not, I'm not trying to be mean. It's the word of God. It's true whether you believe it or not. 
but your life will play out and prove the Bible correct. And I, and I understand it. Listen, sometimes fools can be fun to be around. <laughs> they just they they have fun. They don't have any they don't have any thought of consequence or anything like that. And I get it. And some but you need to set boundaries for those people in your life. Less time with them, more time with wise people so that you become wise. Third and final person. And these people exist. They really do. I've been a pastor for 13 years now, and I'm more convinced than ever that these people exist. There are evil people that you will come into contact with this year. Evil. Not like, oh, they just don't know what they're doing. No, they are purposefully intending to harm you. You might not know that. You might not... You might not believe that, but just because you don't believe something doesn't mean it's not happening. Just because you don't believe something doesn't mean it's not true. Out of the 500 to 2,500 people you will meet for the rest of this year, you will meet wise people, foolish people, but I guarantee you, you will encounter evil people. The Bible says in Proverbs 2, wisdom will deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perversity, from those who leave the straight paths to walk in the ways of darkness, from those who enjoy doing evil and rejoice in the twistedness of evil, whose paths are crooked and whose ways are devious. Evil people. You'll encounter them this year. Why? Because there's an enemy. These people, they don't, they don't depend on the Holy Spirit. They don't depend on themselves. Listen to me. They are literally fueled by demonic forces that are sent to destroy you. It's true. You may say, I don't believe that. I'm going to say it one more time. Just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it's not happening to you right now. There are evil people at your workplace. <laughs> Amen. They're, they're not at church, not at our church, at your workplace. Um, <laughs> there, are evil, there are evil people in your company. There are evil people that you're going to encounter. There are evil people in your family. Like There are evil people that are there, and they are there to calculate and destroy you and your life. And I'm telling you, it's the truth. I, I'm the guy, I try to see the bright side of everybody. I try to see the, the stream of light in the cloud of dark. That's me. But as I've been around people who are wise and discerning, people like Pastor Ryan, people like my wife, uh, Pastor Chanel, pe people like that, as I have been around those people, they have shown me, hey, they really are intending harm on you. And you're just, you're submitting yourself to abuse because you're trying to find. Sometimes, listen to me, people... <laughs> They definitely need help. Evil people need help, but they don't need your help. They need God's help. Prayer is about the best thing you can do for those people. In other words, distance yourself from them. <laughs> they get no time. There's more time with wise people. There's less time with foolish people. But the last, the evil people of your life, there is no time for them. I was um, on vacation and I was jogging. I have no idea why I get this healthy kick when I go on vacation. Anybody else feel that way? <laughs> like I want to jog and do push-ups. Like I want to do you know, CrossFit. I don't know what. It's just crazy. I, I get there, and I'm supposed to rest, and I get up, and I'm jogging. I got my music going. I'm cranking. I'm, I'm running down this road, and there's this house right there that's completely dilapidated. I mean, roof's halfway falling in. Limbs are laying all over it. The grass is, you know, shoulder high. There's There's... Uh, cars, rusted out cars out there. There's trampoline busted up. There's these dogs. There's pit bull. There's this, uh, you know, just yappy dog. And I'm running by this house. There's a lady on the front porch. And I'm running by this house. And these dogs come out and they start yapping at me. So I'm just, you know, being careful. And I'm kind of backing away, feeling like a postal man for a second, just kind of backing away. Okay. And so I run, but I got to run back because it was a cul de sac. So I run by. And as I run back, the lady's in the house. The dogs are still outside. They're yapping at me. As I get to the end of that road, all of a sudden, a police officer shows up. And he looks at me and he goes, Sir, are you causing any trouble today? I said, no, sir. I'm not. I'm jogging, I promise you. Like, it's causing an issue to my body, but I'm not causing an issue to anybody else. And I said, I promise I'm, I'm not. He said, well, he said, we, somebody called about a disturbance out here. He said, I just got to find out which house it was. I said, okay. I said, please, anybody jogging with you? I said, no, sir. I said, it's just me, me and Holy Ghost. It's just me. No. I, I, he, goes, he goes, okay. He goes and he checks. He goes to that house. I saw him as I was running around comes back he says he says hey sir he says you seem like a good guy <laughs> my mama thanks you he says you seem like a good guy good manners I said yes sir he said um I just want to tell you something he said don't go by that house again I thought I did something wrong I was like well what did I do I, I didn't say anything I didn't even, I just I was jogging he goes no 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 he says and these are his exact words that house is pure evil and I went what do you mean he said we constantly get calls of drug trafficking of abuse, 
of, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, sorry, we're, we, we constantly get calls of, of like sex offenders going in and out of that house. We constantly get that call. So he said, that house is just absolute pure evil. So I thought to myself, I'm going to go home and cut my grass to make sure my yard doesn't look like a drug addict house. That's the first, <laughs> that's the first thing I said to myself. But the fact that there's this evil in plain sight, right, right where you're, and you're going to encounter that in your life. And if you haven't already, you're fortunate. But I, I promise you, if you've got any experience on you whatsoever, evil's there. Evil people are there. And you've got you've to put them in the lane they belong in because like I said they definitely need help but they don't need your help and I've seen so many people go downhill because they're trying to help evil people <laughs> I'm just going to say this one more time just, just listen to me just as your pastor just listen to me evil people do not need your help they will drag you down with them evil people need God's help it's one of those moments. It's one of those Paul falling off his donkey road to Damascus experiences that they need. And I'm just telling you from personal experience and from stories I've heard from other people, if you try to drown some, if you try to save somebody who's, who wants to drown, you will drown yourself. Listen to me. I'm not saying be selfish. I'm saying be wise. Put wise people in this lane. Put foolish people in this broad lane right here. And put evil people over there. To close, I want to say this. This year, one time, have you prayed for better relationships? Have you, have you given, given it thought one time? You would think, we always pray, God, give me more money. <laughs> Let me win the lottery. I'll tithe. You know, like that's, that's what we, that's the prayer we all pray, you know. <laughs> it's, it's like, but listen, listen, you pray for your kids. God, let me, help me to get this car that's on E. Help me just get it to the gas station. Like we pray that prayer. But do you pray for your relationships? Because you are going to encounter, it's like the earth, it encounters comets and meteors all the time that we don't see. You are encountering relationships every single day. Are you praying for the discernment to put those relationships in the right places? God, help me to find somebody who's wise. I've, I've prayed that prayer for a season of my life. Help me to find somebody who's wise. I want to spend more time with them. I, I have limited time. I want to invest my time in somebody who can give me something back. God, help me to put the fools in this category. Just, just kind of be their arm's length, so to speak. This is, this is the foolish category. But the evil people, God, protect me from that. Isaiah 41. I shut my Bible before I even got to the passage, and I don't have it on the screen, so just bear with me for one second. Isaiah 41, it says this in verse number 17, I believe it is. Verse 13. For I am the Lord your God. I am your God, who takes hold of your right hand, says to you, do not fear. I will help you. Hey, everybody. The Lord wants you to have good relationships. He'll take you. He'll guide you. He'll give you discernment for those in your life. But you have to begin putting people in the right lanes of your life. But let's just say it like this. Let's just assume that not everybody here is wise. <laughs> What's foolish in your life right now? What's something that you are allowing to drag you down? What's that, you know, like when you're in a boat and you got the anchor down and you don't know you got the anchor down and you try to get, and it's just like it can still go, but it's, it's kind of dragging you. What's that foolish thing, that habit? What's that issue in your life that's dragging you down? What's that thing in your past that's dragging you down? It's foolish. You need to get rid of it. Confess it. Get rid of it. Surrender and submit your life to God. Maybe you're here today and you're evil in, 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 in the fact that you want to do harm to other people. You want, to, you want other people to fail. You want a certain person. You have bitterness in your heart towards somebody. Everybody listen to me. The Bible calls that evil. When you have bitterness and you want somebody to fail, you want somebody to do bad, that's evil. You know what you need to do? Surrender and submit your life to God and he can forgive you for it. Maybe you're wise in here today and you say, I just, I want to continue to be wise. I want to continue to, the path I've got, I've got a good life going for me. I want to continue. You know what the answer is? Surrender and submit your life to Jesus. In all three cases, the answer is the same. Jesus is the hope for your life. Can you bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment, everybody? <laughs> the quality of your relationships will determine the quality of your life. 
You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. You show me the crowd you hang around, I will show you your destiny. Because the quality of your relationships will determine the quality of your life. What relationships do you have that are in the wrong lanes? What relationships do you have that are foolish and they're in the wise category? What relationships do you have that are evil and they're in the wise category? Be so careful. Be, that's dangerous. What, what relationships do you have that you have dubbed as evil, but really it's wisdom? And it's simply because you are acting a fool, you don't want to receive correction. So because they correct you, and therefore they're evil. That's not biblical at all. The Bible says the wise receive correction, consider it, and then move forward. There's a lot of issues, a lot of relationships, a lot of things that God can sift through that the Holy Spirit can help you with today. But you need to surrender and submit your life today. Maybe you're in this room and you say, Pastor Nick, my life is surrendered. I have submitted my life to him, but I've, I've got to do it again. I need to do it right now, kind of a fresh, a fresh start, so to speak. If that's you, just say a prayer. Just say a prayer. Father, I surrender my life. I submit my life to you. I submit my relationships to you. I surrender my relationships to you today. Help me to, to have discernment like, you, like Jesus had. Help me to have discernment of know which category to put people in to seek out the wise people, spend more time with them, to, to arm's length the foolish people, to get away from the evil people, protect me from the evil of this world. That's a great prayer to pray. But maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Nick, I've never given my life to Jesus. Or I did a long time ago, but I've walked so far the opposite direction. I need a fresh start. I need to recommit my life to him. So whether you're for the first time or whether this is a recommitment today, I'm telling you the answer to your life is to surrender and submit your life to God. If you're here, you shouldn't carry anybody around you, nobody else. It should not matter. It's between you and God. It's between you and the Holy Spirit. You say, I need to give my life to Jesus today. Would you, heads bowed, eyes closed, I never call you out, never call you down to the front. It's not how we do it here. But you say, I need to give my life to Jesus. Could you just lift up your hand and say, that's me? Say, today I need to surrender my life to God. There's one in the back. There's another one in the back. Thank you so much. Two people. Anybody else? Say, today I need to surrender my life to God. There's three. Anybody else? Say, I need a fresh start. There's four. Anybody else? Say, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. I need to submit. I need to completely give everything to him. I've messed up my life so much, and I need to get it right right now. I see four hands. Anybody else? The Bible says to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you will be saved. So as you lift up your hand, I believe that's you believing in your heart. I need fixing. I'm not right. I've got to surrender my life to a higher authority, a higher power, and Jesus is who I'm submitting my life to. He is the Son of God. But the second thing is to confess with your mouth, the Bible says. So as you pray this prayer out loud, I'm going to, I'm going to say a prayer. You repeat it. Pray it with everything that you have. Don't, don't let it be just a little dinner table, golf clap kind of prayer. Let it be a meaningful prayer in your life, the most you've ever meant it in your life. And your entire church family will now pray this prayer with you as you pray it. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. Say, you endured torture and pain just so I could have life and good things. Thank you for saving me today. I surrender. Come on, that's important. Say, I surrender my life to you right now. I submit my relationships, my actions, my thoughts, my deeds, everything. I surrender to you. You are the Lord of my life from this point forward. Say, guide me, lead me. Thank you for loving me. I am saved. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, hey, four people at 10 o'clock just gave their life to Jesus. Isn't that awesome, everybody? Hey, come on, let's stand to our feet. Let's sing this out one more time. Come on, he's our hope today. Oh, we sing it. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, my.
Hey, thank you so much for joining us right here at the Jefferson Church.